All righty, I am live. And so far, my luck for the past week has continued. The light up here burnt out about five minutes ago, and I haven't had time to change it. So it's a little bit dark in here. It's because it's a little bit dark in here. Anyway, this weekend, I was trying to build my new electrolysis tank, and didn't quite work out the way I'd hoped. Lots of little Mickey Mouse things just kept giving me a hard time. You know, but that's no big deal. I usually just leave in any mistakes or problems I have in my videos. And, uh, you know, you can see something that you might run across and how to fix it or what not to do. But I got everything all put together, built up, and started filling the tank. Got it about three quarters full, and the bottom of it split. And this last place I would have expected it to break and start leaking on me because it's on the bottom sitting right on the deck and it's, you know, completely supported. I would have figured if anything was going to break on it, it'd be one of the sides because the sides of the plastic tote bulge out a pretty good bit from the weight of the water. But no, the bottom of it cracked. It must have been a bad spot in the plastic or something. It was just a cheap, you know, it was a good size, but it was just a cheap plastic tote. So... There I am. So I didn't get the video made, but I did decide to quit playing around. And I got myself, let me move you here. Hopefully it's, it's black, so of course it's dark. But this is a 65 gallon plastic stock tank. I got it farm and fleet. Cost 80 bucks. More money than I like to spend on things usually. And I did luck out and I found some more stainless steel for my electrodes. These are kick plates off the bottom of doors. You know, if you go to a, into a commercial building, a lot of times you'll see these stainless plates on the bottom of the door, so the bottom of the door doesn't get all banged up. And I got two of them, and they'll work great for electrodes. Whoops, if I can hang on to them. I put one on each end and one in the middle. I have some other stuff I can use in the middle. And, uh, That'll work good for my uh, tank, so that kind of worked out nice, and they're a good size for this. I'm not sure if there's any real benefit to uh, you know completely surrounding the outside of your tank with electrodes. There might be, but uh, I don't have quite enough steel to try something like that. But as I come across these, I'll grab more of them. I see them fairly common whenever we do demolition work, you know, taking out old doors. So uh, I should be able to acquire a few more of these before too long and, you know, line the inside of the tank with them, see what happens, see if it makes any difference. But my old tank, I just had a uh, piece of angle iron in each corner, and that worked pretty good. So, I, you know, I don't know if it's really going to make any difference. But that's a good heavy-duty, you know, solid tank, and that'll work good. Uh, James Ramsdell, what's up? Well, you know, failed... Failed miserably at making an electrolysis tank last week, but I'm on top of her for this weekend, so hopefully I'll get that done, get her up and running, get a video out on it next week. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm going to quit telling people I'm going to do something because as soon as I start, it never fails, something else comes up and I end up having to push it back or it just doesn't get done because something else came up. But I am definitely going to work on that this weekend. And I got a little bit of show and tell things to do. I got one new acquisition over the week. It's a uh, Drew Dutch oven, Drew Holland, most people call them because they have, their logo is Drew, D R U is the name, and it says Made in Holland under it. It's real hard to see the logo on that. You know, it's right, right there. It's pretty faded. But I got this for next to nothing because it's in really bad shape inside. The enamel is peeling off, it's burnt, it's rusty. But I got an experiment in mind for this. And uh, they're known for making these with little tulips on them. In good shape, these are beautiful, beautiful uh, Dutch ovens. They're nice and light, they're real similar to Desco ware. You know, these are, they're made in more or less the same area. And you see it's got little flower dealies there on the lid. And uh, they're real pretty with you know, when they're in good shape and there's different colors this is a green one there's blues and whites and uh they're nice and light 
you know, this is a little bit bigger than the, uh, I have an oval Desco wear Dutch oven. This is a little bit bigger. But like I said, you know, it's, you know, it's pretty bad inside. And that enamel is flaking on the bottom. Just bringing it home, banging around in the truck a little bit, you can see there was little flaky bits coming off it. So it isn't really usable the way it is. And I might be able to do something to rescue it. I'm not sure. I'll have to try it and find out. But these usable ones anyway, they're getting more popular too. You know, they're still relatively inexpensive. One of these in good shape, you know, usually goes 30, 40 bucks depending on the size and the color and all that. But, you know, they're real nice ovens. I mean, they're nice and light, easy to handle. So if you come across one for a good price, go ahead and get it and you won't be disappointed. And, uh, Got a couple things stripped. If you remember that favorite wear, that favorite Scotch bowl I showed you a couple of weeks ago. This is what it looks like out of the lie. That's a trying to get the light there so you can see it. That's a block logo favorite Pico Air number three, probably three quart, and a Scotch bowl. It's got the ring on it and a bale on top. And that cleaned up real good. I'll give that a little bit of a trip to the electrolysis. There's a little bit of rust on the inside that needs to come off. And I run it through electrolysis anyway after I strip them in the lye. Just to get any rust out and get them really good and clean. But that's really going to be nice when I'm done with it. And if you remember that rusty, greasy, little uh, hammered, Chicago Hardware Foundry number three skillet I showed you. It's still rusty, but it ain't greasy anymore. So it's going to take a pretty good application with the electrolysis to get all that rust off there. But scrubbed up fairly good and got all the old grease and nastiness off of it anyway. And uh, back to that stock tank, that's pretty deep. You know, I mean, that's uh, you know, good two and a half, good two, two and a half feet deep. And that kind of raises the uh, possibility of not only having it divided in the middle and having two pans going at the same time, I might be able to stack them, you know, hang one above the other, you know, especially with a smaller pan and, uh, you know, do four at a time, you know, some, you know, you know, have two or three little pans all strung together hanging on one chain, but that'll take a little bit of you know, experimenting to get them hooked up right and build some parts for that but like i say i'll get that thing fired up finally and try it out uh ron thompson howdy yeah those are that's nice that scotch bowl that's really gonna be something yeah i love that i show cast iron well yeah i mean you know, it's kind of the point of the channel you'll show the uh you know show some of the stuff that's out there and uh and available you know i mean because you can Find it a lot of places, flea markets, antique shops, secondhand stores, thrift sales. You can find it online, you know, different auction sites. And this is just stuff I found. And here in a couple of weeks, I'll show you something really cool that I found. It was expensive. I mean, I paid, well, I'm still paying on it. I'll, you know, give her a couple of payments on it. I'm going to pay 250 bucks by the time I'm done. And it's a, uh. I'll tell you, it's a favorite, a favorite uh, product. I think you'll be impressed once you finally get to see what it is. I've been looking for something like that for quite a while, and uh, I couldn't pass it up. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure about the price. I haven't really seen anything like it cheaper, but I've seen a lot of different things similar to it that are a lot more expensive. So, you know, 250 is way more than I usually spend on things, but. Uh, but uh, I decided I'm a sterling fellow and I deserve something nice every now and then. I've been saving my pennies anyway, so I'll get something something to show for it anyway. And uh, I think you'll like it. You'll be impressed when you see it. Uh, what can I do about rust and no electricity machine? Uh, mix up a 50-50 solution of vinegar and water. Just uh, plain white distilled, the cheapest vinegar you can find. As long as it's 5%, some of the really cheap, cheap, you know, dollar store vinegar brands are actually only 4%. They're a little bit weaker. But uh, a 50-50 vinegar solution and, 
you know, make it, mix it up in a tub that's big enough to completely cover whatever you're trying to take the rust off and, uh, leave it sold for a few hours. Kind of depends on how rusty it is. You know, if it's just surface rust, you know, it might only take, you know, two or three hours, but check it after a few hours, kind of scrub it off a little bit, see what kind of shape it's in and just keep putting it back and letting it soak. I mean, if it's really, really rusty, you might want to let it soak overnight before you uh, scrub it off. You know, some people say you should only soak it for two or three hours at a time in vinegar. Vinegar will etch and kind of roughen a uh, real super, super fine cast iron, you know, if it's really a polished kind of finish. But uh, if it's rusty, you know, that's pretty much out the window anyway. And it really takes a long time before you're going to do any real damage to anything. So even if you have to soak it overnight, don't worry about it. But I would try just soaking it for a few hours at first and see how uh, how it goes. Uh, don't find as much iron as I used to. Yeah, I mean a lot of people, a lot more people are getting into it. You know, a lot of people have gotten you know for loads and loads of reasons. You know, especially after the pandemic, because a lot of people are you know figured well, who knows? You might end up having to cook over an open fire. And my aluminum pans ain't going to cut it, so I better get something cast iron. Yeah, you don't feel so bad about springing 300 bucks for a brand new Smithy 12-inch skillet and griddle combo. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the uh, the newer American-made cast iron, apart from Lodge, you know, is pretty spendy. I mean, you know, anywhere from 125 to 300 bucks, depending on size, isn't uncommon anymore. Uh, use baking soda with diluted vinegar. Yeah, I just use uh, straight 50-50 vinegar. And you'll see a kind of, you know, bubbling and fizzing as it works. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a cool thing. I mean, it's something I haven't, uh, I haven't seen a favorite like that. I've seen, uh, I've seen a couple of Wagner, Wagner wear ones. Oh, and I got one of my ratty work shirts on. If you notice these red spots on me, I'm not bleeding. Don't, you know, don't worry. That's just a fire cock. They got slobbered on me. Oh, something else I found while I was out rummaging around secondhand stores is this cookbook, Forgotten Recipes. It's uh, got tons of recipes and household tips from the 20s and 30s. And uh, the first recipe in here is just really cool. I'm going to do this before long, you know, probably within the next month or so, I'm going to, uh, try that recipe, but there's a lot of really neat stuff in here. And, uh, a lot of them will be, you know, good projects for, uh, on the cook stove or over the winter, along with the, uh, the cookbook catalog reprint that I got for, uh, I think it was for Monarch stoves that a bunch of recipes and advertisement for their cook stoves and then some recipes and then some more advertisement. It's pretty slick. Yeah, baking soda does neutralize vinegar. So, uh, you know, you're kind of defeating the purpose by uh, adding baking soda. It'll make it real fizzy for a while, but yeah, you'll, you'll kill the, uh, kill the bacon, kill the vinegar, the acid in the vinegar. The two will pretty well cancel each other out. Ah, hey, somebody from Long Island. That's good to see you. Anyway, with that, uh, with that, uh, rusty Dutch oven, I got a little sandblasting gun. I'm going to see, see if I can sandblast the enamel off the inside because there's really no, you know, good chemical way of stripping it or electrolysis or anything like that. And, uh, even though I'm generally opposed to sandblasting cast iron, this would be, probably the one time I would try it and I think I can you know get a, see what it does see how it works out but it'll be a little bit tricky something like that would be best done in a sandblasting cabinet because when you start you know trying to sandblast the bottom you're, you're going to get a lot of it blowing back but if it does a decent job of uh of removing the uh 
old enamel on the inside. I'll leave the outside like it is because it's kind of pointless to, you know, strip that away. But if I can, uh, if I can, uh, successfully remove that enamel without causing too much of a problem and, uh, you know, it'd be a way that you could, uh, make something that's otherwise useless into something usable again. But, you know, generally you should never really sandblast cast iron for a lot of reasons, because you'd never want to remove metal unless you absolutely have to. And if you don't know what it is already, and you start sandblasting away, you can end up really ruining a lot of, uh, logos or ghost marks or something like that without even knowing it's there. And, uh, sandblasting, you know, it also causes spot heating where the sand is actually hitting the jet of sand is actually hitting the iron that heats up fairly good. And, uh, if there's any stress on the iron or things like that, you can end up cracking it. That's why it's really, really hard to, uh, sandblast sheet metal because unless you really have a delicate touch and exactly the right kind of media for it, it'll uh, overheat it in one little spot and it'll warp sheet metal. You know, it probably wouldn't be enough to warp cast iron, but if you have a bad spot or, a, you know, like a hairline internal stress crack, you could end up cracking it. Uh, can I show you as a blast? Yeah, I yeah, probably would definitely do that. Uh, throw it in a fire and bring it up to a red heat. No, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't do that with cast iron either. I have done it in the past, and uh, and uh, it does work, but again, you have a risk of cracking or warping the pan. And overheating it, especially if it doesn't heat perfectly even, can actually change the, uh, the structure of the iron. I showed you a pan. I don't have it right handy. That's... Uh, got some obvious heat damage it'll drive oxidation deep into the uh iron because cast iron actually has little microscopic flecks of graphite incorporated in the, in the metal and if you overheat it especially if there's enough oxygen you can literally, literally burn that carbon out of the iron and it'll make it more porous it'll change the texture and it'll change the uh, crystalline structure of the iron you'll get hard spots soft parts and it causes stress, so you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't throw cast iron in a fire like that. Yeah, it's that uh, busta. That's pretty nasty on the inside. I mean, I washed it off. It was rusty inside too. You know, you can see where it's rust through. But yeah, it's been burned and overheated. I don't. It doesn't. The outside isn't that bad, so I don't think it's really been overheated. But yeah, I don't know what in the hell they've been cooking in it, or if they just left it half full of something and let it soak for 10 years. Yeah, it can be, it can be tough to reseason heat damaged cast iron. It can be done and in time it usually will, but it takes a lot of patience. You'll have spots where it won't, where it won't take seasoning hardly at all. And it'll want to stick there, you know, and the rest of the pan is okay, but you got, you know, big spot on one side where everything wants to stick. It just doesn't uh, take the seasoning right. Because like I said, it changes the texture. It changes the, uh, the structure of the metal itself. But yeah, it'd be kind of nice, you know, if it's something viable, you know, it doesn't uh, cause too much problems with the iron if it comes off. You know, I mean, I don't know how easy that'll even come off of there sandblasting it. You know, but if it cleans up good on the inside, yeah, you know, then it's a usable Dutch oven again. It won't be enameled anymore. You know, I wouldn't use it for something really acidic, you know, like making sour broten or something. But, uh, you know, for general use, it'd be, you know, a usable Dutch oven again. And you see that sometimes with uh, enameled pans, sometimes they're you know, not enameled on the inside, they're just enameled on the outside, you know, and that's fine. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of times enameled skillets, especially, they'll get overheated, you know, you'll overheat them frying something, and the enamel will start to craze, get, you know, little tiny fine hairline cracks in it. Yeah, you know, that's usually okay up to a point, but, you know, once it starts flaking and popping off, you know, I mean, you can't really, can't really use it anymore. 
I do have an old uh, a Volrath skillet like that. It's a uh, the bottom side isn't enameled, but the inside and uh, you know the outside of the pan is enameled. And it's getting cracked up, and it's got a couple of chips in the bottom, and you can't really use it for. I mean, you probably use it for maybe baking something a little bit, you know, not too terribly hot. You know, which you certainly couldn't fry it anymore. But it looks nice and looks good hanging on the wall and something I didn't pay. I only paid a couple of bucks for it, so it's just kind of neat to have. But something like that, I probably wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't uh, sandblast it, even though it's not really usable as a skillet anymore. It'd still be worth more now, even in the shape it's in. If I ever went to resell it, you know, I'd get a few dollars for it where something that's been sandblasted and doesn't have the uh, enamel on it at all probably wouldn't get very much at all for it. Let's see where my other bottle of water go. I don't think I missed anybody in the chat. Scroll back and double check. Nope. Ugh. Try to get myself situated. Staring out at the dog. He's Looking like he's going to do something, but I'm sure he'll wait until it's less opportunity. I've been doing more collecting than stripping. Now i got to pile them too. Yeah, I feel for you. i got a bunch of stuff. i got a bunch of it that's stripped. i got to do run through the electrolysis tank and reseason. i got a pile of stuff that I need to, need to strip to begin with. Tons of seasoning to do. And, uh, yeah, I never seem to get started on it either. I got some done the other day, but uh, nowhere near as caught up as I had hoped to be. And uh, I, maybe someday I actually will be. And I got to sort through. And I got to thin out a bunch of this stuff. I got a lot of extra extra stuff. I got a bunch of, uh, got a bunch of newer lodge skillets for some reason. And... Uh, I got some nice BSR skillets I'll probably do something with. I don't know if I'll sell them or trade them or give them away. If there's anybody in the area here that, you know, I'd set up uh, a couple of my nieces with sets of cast iron, you know, give them a set of skillets and a Dutch oven and a couple other things. And for some reason, I got a, ended up with a pile of corn stick pans. I don't know how. It's not like I've been actively buying them, but but rooting through and I got a whole bunch of different corn stick pans for some reason. So I'll definitely gonna have to do some, you know, get some stuff finished up and get it actually ready to go and then decide what I'm going to do with it all. You know, cause a lot of times I'll get, you know, get a box of stuff and you'll get four or five pans and there's a couple of them that I want and a couple of them that, you know, I don't need or I already have something like it. And, uh, you know, I usually strip them down, clean them up, along with everything else, get them, get them in decent shape. You know, some of it, you know, I can use for giveaways, and some of it I can, uh, you know, I might end up selling some of it. I don't know exactly yet. I'll have to figure out what all I got. I should have an apprentice like you. Yeah, well, I could use a little bit of help now and then. I cook on a glass stove, glass top stove with cast every day. Uh, you can cook on, you know, a pan with a heat ring on a glass top stove. You know, the heat ring lifts it up off the stove a little bit, so it could be a bit more of a problem. It takes a lot longer for it to heat up. And you don't want to drag the pan across the stove and end up scratching the, la scratching the glass. But uh, as long as you're careful, you can usually do it. Most, uh, especially the newer glass top stoves, it's a lot harder type glass. It's harder to scratch to begin with. And, uh, you know, they can take the weight. So you know, it's usually not a problem as long as you're not dropping it on the stove, which 
can happen. And, uh, you know, as long as you're careful with it, it shouldn't really be a problem. You know, but it, it it can happen. I mean, you can drop a heavy pan full of something on a stove and end up breaking your glass stove, but you can do that with any kind of pan, really. So, uh, you know, as long as, like I said, as long as you're not dragging it around and scratching up your stove, it shouldn't be a problem. But I don't really like glass top stoves anyway. You know, I'd much rather have a, you know, no, if it's an electric, I'd rather have open coils on it or a gas stove or a wood cook stove. Started watching me videos and motivated you to redo an old Griswold 12 a few weeks ago. It turned out great. Oh, great. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, kind of what I'm hoping to do, you know, get, you know, people to, uh, try restoring some of their older stuff and, uh, you know, keep it in good shape and pass it on to future generations because, you know, cast iron lasts pretty much forever. You know, I mean, I've got stuff that's well over a hundred years old that I still use every day and somebody will be using it a hundred years from now, you know, because, you know, it took a little time to, to clean it up and get it in, back into good condition. And, uh, you know, just take care of it. I mean, it's not really, you know, it's not a high maintenance kind of thing. You know, just, uh, whenever you clean it out and whenever you wash, you know, I, I use soap and water on my pans all the time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are still convinced that you should never use soap or never even wash in water, a cast iron pan, but it doesn't hurt anything. And it's fine and dandy. I mean, most methods of cleaning cast iron is just a matter of personal preference. But whenever you, uh, clean a cast iron pan, all you got to do is wipe it out good, dry it on the stove, and give it a light coat of whatever type of oil you usually cook with, a real light coat, you know, and uh, just leave it set, and once it's cool, wipe it down again, wipe off as much of the oil, you just need a, you know, bare little trace of oil on there, and it'll be fine, you know what I mean, it'll keep it, it'll never rust, it'll always be good and well seasoned, you know, it's not, uh, any more work than any other kind of pan, really. Okay, you're careful with your stove. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, as long as it's you're not banging and beating on it, it shouldn't be a problem. You pick it up and the handle is hotter the longer you hold it. I bet you your supply of Crisco, you drop it and it's bye-bye stove top. Yeah, I mean, if you grab a hot handle and you're not ready for it, too, you know, that could be uh, be what uh, triggers you to break your stove top. But like I said, she said she's careful. And as long as you're always make sure you got a hot pad handy or one of those little silicone uh, handles that slide over the handle, you know, Lodge makes them other other places that make them too it's just a little silicone sleeve that fits over your skillet handle it keeps it from well it gets hot but it keeps it cool to grab uh darla you wash yours and soap and too and they work great yeah yeah i mean it's uh once the pan is really seasoned yeah, i mentioned it before there's more to seasoning than just a coat of oil you know seasoning isn't really built up layers and layers and layers of uh polymerized oil seasoning is it's kind of all three there's you know there's oil coating on top and uh the oil eventually will polymerize it'll turn basically to like a varnish type of finish and at the same time the stuff that's really worked down into the uh into the texture of the metal that'll carbonize it'll turn to carbon that's why cast iron turns black with use is because it's getting uh embedded with carbon and all three of those work together as seasoning. That's what a real seasoning is. And uh, you can wash and scrub, and you're not going to scrub that embedded carbon out of the metal. And uh, most of the polymerized oil, you're not going to really scrub off just with the usual washing. So, yeah, I mean, you can wash them, and it's not going to cause any real problems as long as you long as you heat them up and dry them and uh re-oil them when you're done you know and like i say, i do that with my stuff and even if you don't normally uh wash them in soap and water it helps to do it once in a while because it'll keep you from getting an excess buildup on there 
a lot of people say that the pans get sticky on them. And that's because you have way too much oil on them. And that oil is starting to polymerize and get sticky and tacky. And uh, it can be kind of hard to get it off sometimes. You know, sometimes they'll scrub off. Sometimes you can heat it up and wipe it down with oil in the uh, oil will act kind of like a solvent. You know, you can heat it up and wipe it down and keep heating and wiping and it'll eventually get that stickiness off. Yeah, and sometimes you just got to, you know, strip them in lye or oven cleaner because it just ain't going to come off because you got so much on there. Yeah, dry them on a stove top burner. So, yeah, and, uh, you know, that keeps them in pretty good shape. But then again, you know, if there's nothing stuck to it, really all you got to do is wipe it out when you're done. And, uh, you know, that's it. And you're good to go. Just, you know, make sure you don't leave too much on there. You know, when I, uh, lodge handle mitts keep turning your handle silver even after running them through the wash. Huh. I don't know why they would do that. You know, turning it silver, I mean, you're probably getting it right back down to bare metal, but I don't know why, why those little handle covers would do that. That's odd. You know, unless there's some kind of, uh, you know, silicone is pretty inert, though. It doesn't really, uh, you know, it doesn't really leach out any sort of anything that would strip the, uh, excuse me, anything that would really strip off the uh, seasoning on the handle. So I can't, can't imagine unless it's just loose enough that it's just plain wear, you know, shining it up just from uh, rubbing on it. Yeah, that's odd. That's the strangest thing, yeah. But like I say, and uh, whenever I wipe down, you know, re-oil a pan and wipe it out with I use paper towel. You can use, you know, some people say never use paper towel because you get lint on it. Well, you're not going to get lint on it. You know, I mean, if the lint is sticking to it, you have problems other than paper towel lint. But uh, wipe the oil down until it has kind of a satin look to it. I mean, if it looks wet and glossy you got too much on there just keep wiping it until it has kind of a dull sheen and uh you're good to go yeah i'll have to try that with have to get one of those uh handle mitts and try that i don't have any I, you know just got a couple of silicone hot pads i use well i have to uh have to try that and see if it turns my handle silver if it gets them down to metal that, you know, that's what it sounds like is happening anyway, that it's, you know, stripping off the seasoning on the handle. You know, usually handles get a lot of wear and tear from your hands anyway, you know, so it's pretty, pretty thin on the handle. Hopefully next week I'll have a little better topic prepared, a little bit of, a uh, little bit more, but it's fun just to, read the chat and talk back and forth amongst you. I'd like to do a little history bit on, uh, you know, a bit on the history of Griswold because I got some Griswold stuff and I got you know, a few different things, but I'm missing some key pieces, you know, to really do a decent, decent kind of presentation. You know, I have some eerie stuff. I had that diamond logo Griswold skillet, you know, that's pretty cool. But I don't have any uh, Griswold Erie marked. You know, there's a couple other styles of logo that I don't have. And, you know, it's missing enough that I can't really get away with saying, well, yeah, you know, this is the logo in between this one here. So, but eventually I will find some of that sort of things and get a decent, you know, decent show and tell. So you can at least get a halfway decent history lesson out of it. Sticking to dish rags? Yeah, I mean, use whatever you want to. You know, a lot of people use, uh, you know, like cotton rags, you know, something lint-free. I just use paper towel because it works fine. And, uh, you know, I never had any problem with lint for paper towel sticking to it. You don't really get that much lint off anyway. If you're using toilet paper, yeah, you probably get quite a bit of lint off of that. But, uh, you know, paper towel is usually fairly rugged for that sort of thing. Uh, camera, it does, yeah.
And I want to get another uh, chain mail scrubber. I had one years and years and years ago. And uh, it worked pretty good. But I've been using mostly just the uh, stainless steel scouring pads. I take two of the little ones and roll them together like socks and make one big one out of it. But uh, you know, it's been a long time since I tried the chain mail ones. So uh, it does turn to silver. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll have to try it out and see for myself. Just uh, see if I can figure out what's going on with it. Like I said, you know, I, yeah, I can't really think of what silicone would be doing because it doesn't you know, like I said it's pretty inert it doesn't leach out a whole lot of chemicals that I know of anyway or anything that would react with react with iron or you know it'd have to be something fairly alkaline to uh to strip off seasoning you know if it was acidic it would make the handle rusty because you know acid usually makes cast iron rust but uh yeah, it'd have to be something fairly alkaline to uh, to strip it off, and I can't think of anything that's really alkaline about about uh, silicone. Huh. But yeah, I'm gonna try the chain mail again. Yeah, you know, like I said, I haven't used it in years, and there's a lot of different ones floating around. You know, people ask me about it quite a bit, so I'll have to look into that too. I'm not sure I'll forget about it. A million times between now and the time I actually remember to get one. Oh, uh, the fabric knit lodge mitts. Hmm. Yeah, that, well, I really don't know then. Yeah, that's a. Uh, you know, it could be. You know, it could be something in a dye. You know, if there's, you know, if they're dyed a certain color, some dyes are acidic, some are alkaline. Maybe something leaching. I yeah, I yeah, I really don't know. Oh, you found your grandmother's old cast iron pans, a Wagner nine, uh, one notch lodge number eight, and a number five BSR. Really happy. Yeah, those are really nice to find. You know the. Uh, uh, what's the value of a senior? Wagner corn stick pan found one, but it's been sandblasted. Uh, yeah, the sandblasting take a good bit of value off it. Usually, the uh, juniors go for 20 25 bucks, and the uh, the big ones go for you know 30 to 40. Sometimes I've seen them for 50, but uh, usually they're you know in the 35 40 dollar range, you know. But being sandblasted, you know, it's going to take. A good percentage off, you know. So I would say if it's been sandblasted, you know, probably twenty-five bucks. I would be all that I would pay for it. You know, if they want more than that, you know, they can pay you. I would pass, you know, and hold out until I found something better for a little bit more, but in better shape. Because yeah, you know, sandblasting it really uh really hammers the logos on them, especially. You know the uh, lettering because a lot of that lettering is really deep and it rounds off the edges so bad that you can barely see it if it's been sandblasted real heavy. And uh, you know some people have suggested using uh, you know something that's been baking you know blasted soda blasted with baking soda or uh, or glass bead blasting you know but uh, I've never tried that sort of thing either. I don't have any experience with. I've done some sandblasting on a lot of different things, but uh, you know, never using other different kind of media. Ground walnut shells are supposed to be non-abrasive, but uh, it would have to be something that I'd have to try out and see. But you know, I'm still, you know, pretty leery of even other types of media blasting. And until I try it, you know, I won't know. And until I get time to try it, God knows when that's going to be. So. But hopefully I can finally get this electro electrolysis tank project done and get on some of the other stuff. I still want to do sometime within the next couple of months. Like, like I said, I'm getting kind of gun shy about promising to get something done. But I want to uh, do some repair videos, you know, at least a couple of them on welding and brazing cast iron. You know, and even if it's not so much... Uh, 
you know, skillets and other cookware, you know, welding and brazing if you want to uh, restore a, a wood stove, because a lot of times there's repairs that need to be done on those that, uh, you know, some of the techniques, because, you know, it's, it ain't easy welding cast iron. You need the right, need the right uh, materials, you need a high nickel welding rod or welding wire, which is expensive. And uh, you have to preheat everything. And it's tough to keep it from, you know, warping and cracking on you. And uh, I'm a fairly good welder, but I haven't really done a whole lot of welding in the last few years, so I'm kind of out of practice. And uh, I think I've only welded cast iron a couple of times. I've done a fair bit of brazing on it. And, uh, you know, brazing is acceptable for something like on a wood stove where you're not going to see it because, you know, brazing is kind of an ugly, ugly repair. It works good, but, you know, it's nothing you want to see on a skillet or something like that. So welding is a lot better. But like I said, you know, welding is a good bit trickier and it's a good bit more expensive because where like a common welding rod, the uh, the high nickel ones cost a lot more. I mean, uh, I'm trying to remember what I paid for them. It was like, how I many was that? 10 or 15, and I think they were 20 bucks. I mean, they're like a buck and a half a rod for the uh, the high nickel rods where a common welding electrode, just mild steel welding rod of the same size are about a nickel a piece. So it's a good bit more expensive than, and uh, wire for a MIG welder runs about 90 to 100 bucks for a small like a one pound roll of the wire where uh, you can get a 10 pound roll for about very, you can get a lot bigger roll than that to actually, you know, I think for a hundred bucks, you can get, you know, probably a 25 pound roll of a uh, wire for a MIG welder. And so I have to do a little bit of saving up and I have the, uh, the rods for a stick welder, but I want to get a roll of the, uh, of the MIG welder wire for my wire feed. Uh, found a Griswold bailed skillet with a welded handle for 50 bucks. Yeah, that'd be, some, you know, maybe a shunt to pass. Yeah, bailed Griswold skillets are real scarce. And uh, the one that's in good shape, I mean, you're looking a few hundred for something like that if it isn't broken. You know, so one that is broken, if it isn't too ugly of a repair, you know, 50 bucks probably would have been worth it. If you can still find it, I go back and get it. But uh, you know, if it's gone, it's gone. But yeah, the uh, bailed skillets are real scarce. So uh, even fifty bucks for one that's been repaired isn't too far out of line. Just so you you know ha have one. You know, it's kind of a a placeholder in a collection if you're trying to get you know one example of everything. Yeah, you know, if I need an apprentice, I'll think it. Yeah, I'll think it over. But uh, you know, half the fun of having an apprentice is you know torturing them horribly with all the unpleasant hard work, and you got to tease them relentlessly because you know, like I said, they're apprentices, and if you don't tease them relentlessly, there's no fun in it. That's why most trades propagate themselves so that you can have somebody to do all the grunt work for you. But you can't abuse apprentices too much anymore. But it is kind of fun picking on them. Not too bad. I mean, construction workers tend to be kind of a rough lot anyway. Uh, uh, what else? There's one other thing. I'm always forgetting the one other thing. Oh, sorry you're late. Oh, don't be sorry. It's just good to have you here. 
whenever you show up. It's never too late unless, of course, it's too late and then you can watch it on the watch it on the regular channel anyway. Go back and see what you miss. And, you know, sometimes you actually miss something good and sometimes it's just kind of me rambling on, so you never know. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always doing that. You know, usually I have, you know, at least four or five, maybe sometimes even six different things I want to talk about and, uh, and mention. And I'm always forgetting about half of them. You know, you can get through two or three pretty good. And then, oh, uh, what was that I was going to say? Uh, it'll come to me about 10 minutes after I get done with the show. And, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I'm just drawing a complete blank on it. I have all the good info. Well, I try. I mean, you know, I understand what I know, but there's tons of stuff I don't know and I haven't seen yet. You know, so I'm always... Always looking. Have you seen those Blackstone grills? Yeah, I've seen them. You know, I don't know anybody offhand that has one. No paying a lot of old knowledge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Blackstone, I mean, they look like they're pretty, you know, pretty good, good uh, setup. You know, like I say, you know, I don't know anybody near at hand. I've never seen one in action, but, uh, you know, the people that do have them are, seem to be pretty pleased with them. You know, they're great for doing all kinds of things outside. And you just uh, season up the top like you would any other cast iron, and away you go. Let's have you. Got a couple of extra water bottles here. Dying of thirst. Ah. Starting to turn hot and humid again. It's been nice the last few days, but... It's going to be nasty over the weekend, starting tomorrow, actually. It's going to drive me nuts, you know, sitting here completely blanking out. Uh, what was my first cast iron piece, and when did I start collecting? Uh... You know, my wife always had cast iron, too. And so, uh, you know, and Ma cooked with it quite a bit. She had a few things. Probably the first one that I bought for myself. I'm trying to remember which one it was. It was a Wagner Ware. It was a marked Wagner Ware. And I uh, had that for quite a while. I think it was a number seven. You know, a little bit smaller than, than that. But, uh... You know, started really collecting, you know, getting into it maybe five or six years ago. Yeah, because we had quite a few bits and pieces of cast iron that we'd accumulated over the years and started really looking into it. And, uh, you know, finding out the history on it and stuff like that. You know, started getting really interested and, uh, you know, it kind of took off from there. And so really about, you know, about five or six years I've been really into collecting it but you know it's something i've pretty much always been around been around my whole life so yeah i think uh last time mom moved i think my sister wound up she had uh a couple of griswold skillets that she gave her and an old there's a gray enameled lid can't remember what uh, it was any particular brand, you know, but she had that since I was a kid, and I think my other sister wound up with that. But I got some, uh, you know, some stuff from my wife's mother, that uh, green, I know I've used it in a couple of different videos. I have a, uh, it's a number eight BSR Century Series uh, chicken fryer with a lid. It's green enameled. It's pretty, uh, you know, it's a nice pan. And she used it for 
forever and ever. Uh, Mark Wagner wear 1891, 12 inch, about 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's when they came out. It was in the 90s. The uh, Wagner 1891s, they were a uh, centennial celebration. They made them in the 1990s. I think from like, you know, 92 up to almost up to 2000, they were making those to celebrate their uh, centennial because Wagner wear started in 1891. And uh, I've got a 1892 patent date uh, Wagner waffle iron. You know, so that could have been anywhere from 1892 up until I think patents were 12 years in those days. And you could renew them once and they you'd usually put a new patent date on it. So somewhere between 1892 and 1904, it would have been made. I like to think it was made in 1892 just because. That's what it says on it. But, uh, you know, it's pretty nice. Nice little waffle iron. We've had that for years and years and years, too. Uh, I don't even remember where we got it, but something that we've, the wife and I have pretty much always had. So, Patricia, I'll throw that back at you. What was the first cast iron thing you got? And anybody else listening, for that matter, you can uh, chime in with the first cast iron piece that you got. You know, and even if you don't already collect it, I mean, it's just a good thing to have a little bit of knowledge on how to care and use it. But, you know, it's the sort of thing you can kind of slide into real easy. It can get to be, get to be quite the addiction, you know. You know, it's fun just kind of going out, you know, shopping around and seeing what you can find. I mean, that's half the fun of it is, you know, the hunt is as much fun as the catch. Oh, the corn stick pan. Uh, unmarked Wagner wear chef skillet. Yeah, I'd love to get it. I don't have any chef skillets. Uh, I know Lodge, you know, Wagner wear made them, and uh, Lodge made some. I don't know if Griswold did or not offhand. Was the early cast iron composition different than later? Yeah, uh, it has changed over the years because, you know, foundries have always used a certain amount of scrap iron in their uh, stuff. And uh, as the automotive industry took off, there was more and more cast iron used for things like engine blocks and transmission castings and things like that. And you needed to uh, have a little bit better wear characteristics for an engine block. So the main composition of cast iron is cast iron. There's a certain amount of uh, graphite. It's not incorporated in the steel like or incorporated in the iron like carbon is in steel it's uh actually embedded you know it's you know it's mixed in but it's not really a part of it uh there's cast iron there's iron graphite uh certain amount of silica uh phosphorus but that's usually considered a contaminant a couple other things that i can't think of offhand but anyway as you started getting more automotive scrap into it the uh characteristics of it changed a bit where the really old you know pre-1900 cast iron was mostly really pure iron you know i mean it was mostly you know like virgin iron made directly from ore and processed and refined that way and uh it was used for different things so it had a little bit different composition and there's there's more than one type of cast iron you know there's a gray cast iron which is the most common that's what's used for skillets and there's uh white cast iron has different uh you know different elements added to it so yeah the composition has changed over the years uh 1850s gate mark calder from your grandma's grandma yeah that's really cool yeah i have a couple of gate marked cauldrons i got one in the uh lie tank right now in fact 
but yeah, I got one, you know, probably from 1845 up to 1860. And I think that's the oldest, the oldest uh, cast iron that I have. Uh, cornbread doohickeys. Yeah, a lot of people seem to start off with those because they're pretty cool because, uh, you know, there's a neat little thing. And uh, another thing, they also kind of changed the uh, the composition, the iron, as it got into more of the automated mold making, so it would fill better, different flow characteristics. Still trying to find a use for cal cauldrons. Any ideas? No fancy cooking stew in it. Hmm. Uh, if it's a smaller one, they make uh, they make nice bread. They call it bucket bread. You know, they're good for baking bread and things like that in them. Or if you want to make a really big loaf of bread and you got a great big cauldron, they can work kind of good for that. Although the three-legged ones with a round bottom are kind of a pain to put in a, on an oven rack because they don't want to sit really flat. Yeah, the new cast iron, yeah, it cooks, you know, just as well as the old does if uh, you're using it right. You know, most of the changes to the metal have been to uh, accommodate different manufacturing processes and, you know, because of different sources of metal too. So, you know, sometimes they'll adjust the manufacturing to what's available. Sometimes they'll adjust the raw material to fit the manufacturing process. How are you pre pre yeah, preparing witches brew? Well, yeah, I mean, if you're going to do any sort of witchcraft, you got to have a decent cauldron. You know, that just goes without saying. It's no fun if you don't. Yeah, I made, made bread and cast iron Dutch oven. Yeah, they're great for that. Yeah, I use that. Uh, I have a little uh, yellow enameled Desco ware. You know, it's an oval roaster Dutch oven. And uh, it works great for uh, sourdough bread. But yeah, you can make a, you can bake bread in them. You could... You could, uh, I'm sure you could do it like a roast. You could use it like a Dutch oven if you have a lid for it. And like I say, if it's not too tippy in the bottom of your, in your oven rack, you could do things beyond stew, you know, baking, roasting. You know, you can definitely do that. You know, if you're going to be cooking over a campfire, you could do it like a Dutch oven. If you have a, if you have one that has a bale and you have a tripod or a crane that you can hang it over the fire. You can do a lot of different different things like that with them. Uh, my favorite seasoning for chicken. You know, I usually deep fry chicken. And uh, I'll ro dip it in, uh, you know, beat up a couple eggs, dip it in that. And then use cornstarch. You know, just straight cornstarch with uh, salt, pepper, you know, maybe a little bit of cayenne pepper in it. And then uh, dip it in the egg, then roll it in that, and then deep fry it. And it's really good. It gives a really nice crispy coating. And uh, the cornstarch, if you use flour and you try and reuse your oil, after a couple of batches, your oil oil will start getting foamy on you because of the uh, flour. With cornstarch, it doesn't do that. So, you know, if you uh, save the oil from your deep frying and you have problems with it foaming, you know, that'll definitely take care of it. And once I get it fried, I usually... Uh, douse it with crystal hot sauce well i do have to i do make a pretty good hot sauce of my own just a you know basic cayenne and vinegar hot sauce and i've got some dried cayennes from last year i haven't got around to uh making that up yet but they ain't going anywhere they're i dehydrated them dried them out good got them in a sealed jar so i dehydrate quite a few things too uh, no, I don't have a video making hot sauce. You know, it's really easy. It's just, uh, I usually break them up a little bit and uh, simmer them in vinegar for a little while, just kind of soften them up. Throw them in a blender and let that blend for a while to really pulverize everything and then run it through a sieve to get the uh, skins and seeds out. But it'll let the, it'll let the uh, pulp pass through. Uh, Frank's Red Hot. Yeah, Frank's Red Hot is good. 
you know, I don't, I'm not really a big fan of Tabasco sauce, but uh, I like cayenne, really like cayenne pepper, you know, the uh, cayenne based ones, uh, Crystal, Frank's Red Hot is another good one. Uh, there's a couple other brands that I can't, you know, that I've tried that I like, but I just can't think of them right offhand. You know, the Tabasco peppers, I don't, you know, they got a little different taste to them that I don't really care for. I mean, it's okay, but uh, love to see you do one on chicken. I do have a video where I uh, I made some champagne battered fish and uh, French fries. That's on my channel or somewhere you'd have to look through. I think I did it about a year ago, a year and a half. Texas Pete. Yeah, I haven't tried that. I'll have to give that a shot. Yeah, I mean, I like things fairly hot, you know, but I don't need something that's going to burn for, you know, just plain heat. You know, some of these, you see like the one chip challenge where they have, you know, Carolina Reaper and ghost peppers and, you know, three or four different real super hot, high Scoville number peppers all on one little Dorito chip type of thing. You know, and it just fries your mouth. You know, man, that's all it really does for you. But uh, I find that most cayenne sauces, you know, they really have a good flavor to them beyond just being hot. You know, they're they're not super, super hot. You know, it's nothing, you know, in the lethal range. But uh, they really add a good flavor to it. Yeah, uh, Shinodo, Shinodo uh, go check out that uh, champagne battered fish. That was that turned out really good. I like that, and uh, you know, like a beer batter, it has the same kind of a you know consistency as a beer batter. But where a beer, you know, you mean you pick up the bitterness and the maltiness from the uh, beer. If you use just cheap sparkling wine, and uh, it gives it more of a tangy, tart taste to the batter, it's really good. Anyhow, well, with that, in fact, if you give me a second here, I can go and find, yeah, Louisiana hot sauce. Let me check through my videos here quick, and I'll get you a uh, get you a link for that one. Animal skewers, history, history, history. Maple beans, crystallized ginger. There we go. I'll have to mute that quick and get the link. Copy that. StreamYard. And paste. There you go. That's the link to the uh, champagne battered fish. And I made french fries with it too. The trick to getting french fries, homemade fries that stay crispy, is you cook them twice. You cook them for about five minutes at like 250 degrees. And then you take them out and you drain them and chill them. And once they're good and cold, after a couple hours in the fridge, then you fry them up. And uh, yeah, they're really good that way. They stay nice and, uh, you know, they stay nice and crispy and crunchy. They don't go limp on you. I uh, just got here starting at the beginning, though. But hi, all. Yeah, come around. Uh, I see you've been using that Apple Skeever pan. Made a batch of those. Those are fun. You know, like I said, you know, I made those uh, kind of backward scotch eggs with it. There's a lot of different little things I want to try playing around with that. And, uh, you know, the Apple Skeever pans are, you know, a lot of different uses for them, I think be a pretty you know pretty useful tool besides just uh pancake balls filled with jelly you know like i mentioned it before i'm going to try and work up a you know batter where you get more of a pastry kind of like a jelly donut you know more of a you know yeast type of thing and uh you know make more you know see if i can make like a mini bismarck type of thing that'd be fun you know, a couple other things I've been kind of considering with doing with it. Try and cake mix. Yeah, I bet you that would work. I bet you brownie mix would work good in that, too. If you did, uh, 
you know, did little brownie balls. That'd be cool. You know, with a, you know, chocolate kind of filling. That'd be a really neat thing. But yeah, it sounds like a, sounds like quite the thing to try in the cake mix. You can make almost like a Twinkie almost, uh, you know, little Twinkie balls on them if you use a cream filling and a yellow cake. No, yeah, and yeah, hi, Billy Lee. I hadn't noticed you. If you were in here earlier, I must have just kind of skipped right past you. Sorry about that. <coughs> but anyway, I've been going on for an hour. I uh, bought a vintage KitchenAid stand mixer over the weekend. Need ideas on what to do with it. Uh, they're a real useful thing to have in the kitchen. You can, uh, they're great for kneading bread dough. You know, it saves, saves a ton of work making bread. And, uh, you know, I mean, I hardly, you know, I just let my, uh, mixer do all the kneading for me. You know, I just basically just shape it and don't really need my bread anymore. Yeah, Twinkies and brownies would be great in those. Yeah, I mean, of course, they look like, you know, giant rabbit turds, but... The brownie, the uh, brownie balls would be pretty cool. Yeah, Twinkies have a 30 year shelf life. That's a lie. I mean, it's much, much closer to 75. But uh, yeah, stand mixers, there's a, little, there's a lot of useful attachments for it, too. Uh, I have a meat grinder for it, and I have it's a spiralizer. I mean, it's kind of a specialty tool for you know, you can uh, it's great for peeling apples if you have a ton of apples to uh to process through you can peel and slice up apples with it really cool and it has different blades and you can make uh potato strings with them and those are really neat you know but like i said you know unless you do a lot of stuff like that because it's fairly expensive i mean the cost anywhere from if it's on sale you can get it for about 80 bucks but usually they're about 100 or more you know so unless you do a lot of things like that you know it's not really worth it but it's really useful if you do and they make a bunch of other things. They make an ice cream maker for them too, but I guess they have a have a bad time with those because the uh, instead of you know, having a tub inside and a tub outside and you fill it with salt and ice, it has a, a tub with that blue ice gel, and you put the tub in the freezer. But I guess a lot of people have a hell of a time with those uh, tubs leaking and the gel coming out of them, so. Yeah, I couldn't recommend recommend that. If they ever get one that works good, it would be a pretty slick deal. But uh, I guess the one they have is really isn't worthwhile. But uh, yeah, the meat grinder is great. They make pasta rollers. If you make, you know if you want to make a lot of homemade pasta, pasta rollers. So I mean, there's a million different things you can do with a KitchenAid stand mixer. So, uh, but anyway been going at this for over an hour now so i'm gonna take off and let you guys go and i'll see you next week and hopefully i'll be a little bit more organized i think you used your mixer once in the last five years yeah i use mine all the time making bread and uh and other things with it so you know kind of depends on what you need you know and what you do with it or what you want to do but anyhow i'm gonna take off here and uh i'll see you guys next week be sure to like the video if you actually did like the video. Subscribe if you're not. If you feel so inclined, go ahead and hit the join button and you can become a channel member. You know, there's privileges to being a channel member. You know, not a whole lot, but there are some. You get to be on a private Facebook page and we do other things now and then. But anyway, we'll see you all later and thanks for watching. And